Could, could Christian leaders, could they become a mouthpiece for Satan? Could they, could they be like citizens of Troy who, who brought in that Trojan horse full of the army of, of the Greeks? In this session, we're going to talk about origins in the biblical worldview. And I want to begin with a, uh, a quote from uh, the Boston Globe a few years ago, which quoted a statement by Michael Roos, a very uh, well-known atheist philosopher of science. While scientists and creationists often square off over the scientific evidence for evolution, the source of the ongoing dispute is deeper. This is not just a fight about dinosaurs or gaps in the fossil record, says Roos, speaking from his home in Florida. This is a fight about different worldviews. Well, I disagree with Michael Roos about a lot of things, but I totally agree with him on this point. It is a battle of worldviews. Um, just before the Creation Museum opened, um, Lawrence Krauss, who is an atheist astroph astrophysicist, very, very well known, had some comments about the Creation Museum. He actually made these comments uh, a little more than a week before we opened, so he never actually saw the museum, but this is what he says. This museum is uh, full of scientific fraud, lies, it's a travesty, false, misguided, misinformation is presented, colossal unreason, it's hypocritical, it misrepresents, it's got bad science, it's manifestly false, it's religiously motivated fraud. So he's, he's pretty uh, concerned about the Creation Museum and the worldview that's being presented there. The worldview of, of uh, Christianity is based on the Word of God. And from the truths in the Word of God, we develop a Christian worldview, a, a way of looking at the world, at life, at ourselves, to understand the world that we live in. But most of the world doesn't build their thinking, their worldview on God's Word. They build their thinking on man's word, what man says, what scientists say, what experts say, or just uh, a person's individual personal opinion. And so develops a secular worldview that is very contrary to the Christian worldview. So man's worldview is not a good foundation for the Christian worldview. Uh, when we try to build our Christian worldview on what man says about the world, uh, we're going to have problems. Rather, we see the secular worldview that is based on man's authoritative words about reality. And so in Answers in Genesis, we like to talk about the seven seas of history, the seven key words that summarize seven key events that... Uh, help us to understand the world and is the foundation for the biblical worldview. So we have uh, creation, corruption, the fall of man, uh, catastrophe, Noah's flood, confusion, the Tower of Babel, Christ uh, coming into the world to be the savior by dying on the cross, rising from the dead, and one day he's coming again to consummate history. That is the, the biblical worldview and uh, the, the really key foundational points of the Christian worldview. We're going to focus in this series on the first four C's uh, because a lot of uh, Christians have ignored or rejected those first four C's. And as I'm going to argue, they don't have a Christian or really more appropriately describe biblical worldview, or it's partially biblical. So what is a worldview? Let's talk about that a little bit. A worldview is a set of beliefs or concepts or assumptions that everyone has. Everyone has a worldview. Uh, they may not be aware of it. They may not uh, think carefully about it, but everyone has one. And that worldview, that set of assumptions and beliefs may or may not be true. Some of them might be true beliefs or assumptions. Some might be false. Um, these assumptions or concepts or beliefs are philosophical and religious in nature. Uh, they, they don't come from science. Uh, and uh, they are ideas which a person uses consciously or unconsciously to make sense of and live in the world 
real world. Um, oftentimes people may profess one worldview or one set of assumptions, but actually live by another one, and they're not consciously aware of that inconsistency. So a worldview answers a number of very important questions. These are just a few of the examples. Is there a God or not? Are there multiple gods or one God? Um, your answer to that question will have a big effect on uh, how you view the world, how you view yourself, how you view others. Uh, what is the universe? Uh, is it the creation of God? Is it eternal? Uh, did it create itself? Uh, that's a very important question. What is man? Is man an animal? Is man made in the image of God? Is, is man uh, a mixture of divine and human? Uh, another question, is knowledge possible? Is there right and wrong? These are important questions for living our lives. And uh, a worldview answers those questions. And there are many different worldviews. Why is it important for every Christian to understand worldviews? I think there are several reasons. Uh, first of all, we need to understand worldviews to be a consistent, faithful, and mature follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said to Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. You see, different worldviews have different ideas, and some of those ideas are false. Some of those ideas are true. It's really important for us to know the truth, and we will know the truth as we build our thinking on the Word of God. Uh, in Matthew 22, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And uh, it's not... It's not enough for us to just love God with our heart, uh, to feel a love for God, to, to sense uh, a love for him in our souls. We need to love him with our minds. And that means really being concerned about truth because God is a God of truth and he wants us to know the truth. In 2 Thessalonians, um, Paul talks about uh, just before the return of Christ, one will arise who is coming in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. So God places a very high premium on truth, and we need to love the truth, which means we need to be concerned about uh, ideas out there on these fundamental questions, these worldview questions. We need to know the truth, and we need to believe the truth. A second reason that we should uh, understand worldviews is not just that it enables us to be a consistent, faithful, mature follower of Christ, but by knowing and understanding these things, at least at a basic level, uh, it helps us to avoid being subtly and unknowingly deceived by non-Christian worldviews and as a result becoming compromised. Um, in Colossians 2, Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Paul warned about deception. In fact, there are a number of verses in the Bible that warn us about deception. You can be deceived. I can be deceived. If we're only allowed to hear certain information about a, a particular topic, um, and we're not allowed to hear any other perspective to stimulate our thinking and ask, uh, get us to ask questions, we can be deceived. And Paul warns about being deceived by the traditions of men, the philosophies of men, the elementary principles, that is, the basic ideas that most people live by, worldview ideas. In 1 Timothy 6, Paul says to Timothy, uh, as a young pastor, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. There are ideas out there in the world that are called knowledge, that are called truth, that are not really true. And we need to be able to discern that lest we be deceived and go astray from the faith. Well, 
We need to be consistent, faithful, mature follower of Christ. We need to uh, avoid being deceived by understanding worldviews. And third, we need to be able to understand and effectively communicate to lost souls who are trapped in false worldviews. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience for of Christ. So as we engage in sharing our faith with other Christians, uh, with, with non-Christians, um, we, we need to be able to uh, understand and perceive their false assumptions so that we can help them to understand the truth. Again, we, we can't all become experts in philosophy and religion, but we all need a basic understanding of worldviews, and we need to understand the biblical worldview. In 1 Peter 3, Peter says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And it's as we understand well the biblical worldview uh, and know how to explain it and are, and are at least uh, aware of some of the false assumptions in the other worldviews, that it enables us to, to make a strong defense for the Christian faith. In Jude 3, Paul says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about a common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. And so down through the centuries, uh, Christians, faithful Christians, mature Christians have been engaged in contending earnestly for the faith, which means they have been aware of the battle of worldviews, false ideas, assumptions um, that contradict the biblical worldview and the gospel. So these are some of the really important questions that we uh, need to understand answers to, and the Bible provides answers to those questions, and we're going to see in uh, subsequent presentations uh, what the Bible and what the world that God made has to say about these questions. Well, let's summarize a little what the Christian worldview is. In the Christian worldview, God is the infinite, eternal, holy, transcendent creator of all things. He's not a created being. He is uh, the eternal creator. And he is above and beyond and outside of creation. So if the, if the physical creation disappeared, God would still exist. Uh, the universe is created. It's finite. It didn't create itself. And it is subject to and dependent on the sovereign creator. Man is created in the image of God. Um, that is, makes him separate and distinct from all the animals, and man is accountable to God. He's not autonomous. He's not his own, uh, his own God, his own Lord, although a lot of people try to live that way. True knowledge of the creator and the created world is possible, and truth is absolute. So we can know things about the creator, and we can actually know the creator personally, and we can know real true things about the world. Uh, we don't know everything because we're finite, but we can know real true things. And there are truths that are true truths in the sense that they are true for all people in all cultures in all times. They are absolute truths. Another point of the Christian worldview is that God has revealed himself and truth in creation, in man's conscience in providence, in God's acts in history, in miracles, and supremely through his written word, the Bible, and the incarnate word, uh, Jesus Christ, the God who became human. Absolute moral laws exist. This is a fundamental principle of the Christian worldview. And those laws are impressed upon our conscience, and they reflect the character of, of the creator. And so everyone, regardless of their culture, they know that lying or stealing is wrong, at least when someone lies to them or steals from them. They know that murdering another person is wrong, uh, at least if it's murdering their mother or their child. 
So there are these moral absolutes that apply to every culture and every time. And another point of the Christian worldview is that there is a Christian worldview perspective on every topic, biology, geology, astronomy, sociology, politics, marriage, clothing. The Bible informs us, uh, gives us the, the assumptions and the truths to think correctly about all those different topics in all those different areas. So the seven C's of history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, and consummation. We're going to look at those uh, in depth, particularly the first four as we go through uh, this series of lectures, and we will show how they are foundational to the last three. Now, there are many anti-Christian worldviews, uh, deism, which is the view that there's a God who created the world, but he's distant, he's in the past. He's not involved in his creation. Uh, modern liberal theology is basically deistic. Atheism or naturalism or materialism, those are all uh, basically the same, uh, same idea. Uh, there is no God, matter is all that exists, nature is all there is, and everything can be explained by uh, time and chance and the laws of nature working on matter. Pantheism or monism, which says that God is the creation, the creation is God. Uh, you're God, I'm God, the rocks are God, the, the building I'm in are, is God. Uh, that's pantheism. Polytheism is belief, belief in many gods. And uh, that is also animism. And so the tree God, the sun God, the moon God, the river God, uh, and then postmodernism, which says that um, all the different worldviews are simply um, a, a personal uh, preference of ideas that impose on other people's views. And in the postmodernist view, there's no absolute right and wrong. There's no absolute truth. These are different worldviews that are very contrary to the biblical worldview. And they are all based on or compatible with evolution in millions of years. They, they have no problem with the evolutionary ideas. Now, when I say evolution, a lot of people think of biological evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution. But evolution is actually a three-part theory to explain all of reality. So you have biological evolution to explain the origin of life and the origin of man. And then you have geological evolution to explain the origin of the earth and the origin of rock layers and, and fossils and the origin of the topography of the earth over millions of years. And then you have cosmological evolution to explain the origin of stars and galaxies and planets and, and, and moons and asteroids over millions of years. That's all evolution. Most people don't realize that. And so they'll say, well, I don't believe in evolution. And what they mean is they don't believe in biological evolution. Theodosius Dobzhansky was one of the greatest evolutionists of the 20th century, a geneticist originally from uh, Eastern Europe, but taught at some of our major universities in the United States. He said, evolution comprises all the stages of the development of the universe, the cosmic, biological, human, or, or cultural developments. Attempts to restrict the concept of evolution to biology are gratuitous. Life is a product of the evolution of inorganic or non-living nature, and man is a product of the evolution of life. A few years ago, I was online and I found a, a slide in a, uh, a online course at Harvard University, and they had this picture entitled Cosmic Evolution from Big Bang to mankind. And so you have particulate evolution, the formation of the first particles, galactic evolution, the formation of galaxies, stellar evolution, the formation of stars, planetary evolution, chemical evolution, biological evolution, cultural evolution. And uh, in the future, um, evolutionists, many evolutionists believe we're harnessing evolution. We'll be able to control evolution with artificial intelligence. This is all evolution, according to evolutionists. Back to Michael Roos, the atheist. I'm an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian, but I must admit that in this one complaint, and uh, Mr. 
really, Dr. Duane Gish is but one of many to make it, the literalists, referring to young earth creationists, are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it is true of evolution still today. Evolution therefore came into being as a kind of secular ideology, an explicit substitute for Christianity. So the idea that evolution is just science, that, that evolutionists are just un, un, unbiased, objective pursuers of truth, who are letting the facts speak for themselves, that is a myth. Evolution is a religion. It's a substitute for Christianity. And he says, evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. Well, very different meaning and a very different morality than biblical Christianity. Evolution is based on what uh, we can call philosophical naturalism, and there some basic assumptions of this uh, philosophy that control science today. The first is that nature is all that exists. Now, not all scientists believe that. There are scientists who do believe in God or follow one of these religions we've mentioned. Uh, but most scientists do their scientific work as if nature is all that exists. So they might believe in God on Sunday or Saturday or whenever they're reading their religious holy book, but when they do their science, they do it as if nature is all that exists. The second assumption is that everything can and indeed must be explained by three things. Time plus chance plus the laws of nature working on matter. If you have those three things, time, enough of it, millions and millions of years, chance, and the laws of nature, the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, uh, the laws of genetics, uh, working on matter, you can explain the origin of everything. You can explain the origin of stars and galaxies and planets. You can explain the origin of the earth and rock layers and fossils. You can explain the origin of life, the origin of man, the origin of language, the origin of culture. All you need is enough time, chance, and the laws of nature. Well, those are the assumptions of what philosophers would call naturalism. It comes by another name also. That is the religion of atheism, the assumptions of atheism. And atheism today controls science. Not all scientists are atheists, but most scientists are doing their scientific work as if atheism is true. Well, a few years ago, uh, Danny Aiken, who is the president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, spoke at a worldview conference for high school students and college students. As I recall, there were about 2,000 students at this conference. And uh, he said this about the Christian worldview. The belief that God is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe who sovereignly rules it today. To act like Jesus, we must think like Jesus. To live biblically, we must know what the Bible says, understanding it, and then integrating it into the totality of our lives. I couldn't agree with him more. That's absolutely correct. Then he goes on in his lecture to list points of the uh, biblical worldview, the Christian worldview. There are absolute moral truths. Those truths are revealed in and defined by the Bible. Jesus lived a sinless life. God is the all-powerful, all-knowing creator who sovereignly rules it today. Salvation is an unearned gift from God. Satan is real. A Christian has responsibility to share his faith in Christ with others. And the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. I totally agree. Those are key truths of the Christian worldview. But then he goes on to say, these points... Those eight points are non-negotiable, not optional. To jettison even one is to seriously compromise a genuine Christian worldview way of thinking. Again, I totally agree with him. And those are really important things to tell those high school and college students. But then he goes on to say in that lecture, based upon our current understanding of the Bible and reliable scientific evidence, we remain open to issues like the age of the earth and the universe. We understand that the real debate is between intelligent design 
and natural selection and random mutation, between theistic creation and naturalistic atheistic evolution. At this point, I have to strongly disagree. We can't be open to the issues like the age of the earth and the universe. The debate is not between intelligent design versus natural selection and mutation, although there is a conflict there. It's not between theistic evolution and naturalistic atheist, uh, theistic creation and naturalistic atheism. No, the, the real debate is between the biblical worldview and all other worldviews. And accepting millions of years is not consistent with the biblical worldview. The truly Christian worldview must be the biblical worldview. And I hear, I hear lots of people today talking about the fact that not many Christians in America have a Christian worldview. But as I probe a little bit, I find that many of those who are saying we've got to have a Christian worldview don't really have a fully biblical worldview. And that is what is urgently needed. The biblical worldview, as I'm going to argue, as I've already started to argue, is the young earth creationist view. And theistic evolution and all other old earth views in the church today, and we'll talk about them, the gap theory, the day age view, the framework hypothesis, and many others, they are not the biblical worldview. They are contrary to the biblical worldview. So the issue is not whether science and religion are compatible or not, because the question is, what do we mean by science and which religion are we talking about? It's not the, the, the term science and religion are too vague when people use this language. We've got lots of religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, liberal theology, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, and, and many others. All these are based on or compatible with evolution and or millions of years. So it's not an issue, it's not a question of our religion and science uh, compatible. The issue is not whether someone can have faith in Christ and be a good scientist. The issue is not whether science and religion are compatible. The issue is not whether there's a creator God or not. I mean, those are important questions, but that's not the real issue. The issue is whether the naturalistic evolutionary story about the universe, about life, is compatible with biblical revelation in the gospel. That is the real issue, and a lot of Christians are not thinking carefully about that. One is Tim Keller, a very highly respected pastor from New York, a Christian author. He said this, Many people today, both secular and Christian, want us to believe that science and religion cannot live together. Not only is this untrue, but we believe that a thoughtful dialogue between science and faith is essential for engaging the hearts and minds of individuals today. The BioLogos Foundation provides an important first step towards that end. Well, I'm going to say very clearly, science and religion can live together. Uh, all those religions I just mentioned are perfectly happy with living with evolution. But the question is, let's be more careful about what science is. And we've got to be more careful about what we mean by faith. Here in an article about um, evangelicals' views of science, we read, We asked our survey respondents how they personally view the relationship between religion and science. Again, those vague terms, you're not going to get a clear answer. Rather than saying that the two are in conflict, evangelicals were the most likely to say that they view religion and science as having a collaborative relationship in which the two spheres support each other. That's 48% of evangelicals. Or that religion and science are each independent and refer to different aspects of reality. That's another 21% of evangelicals. And I would say most evangelicals are thoroughly confused because of these vague words of religion and science and the vague uh, definition or uh, distorted definition of the Christian worldview. The real issue is whether we believe the infallible word of our holy God 
or whether we believe the fallible words of sinful men who write our science textbooks. That is the real issue today uh, that we're facing in this creation evolution debate. So I, I represent philosophical naturalism this way, as a, a three-stranded rope. Biological evolution, geological evolution, cos cosmological evolution. Um, theistic evolutionists are people who accept all three strands of evolution, uh, but they just believe that, uh, and so I call them three-thirds evolutionists, uh, they believe that God used evolution to create the world over millions and millions of years. So they're not atheists, they're theists, they believe in God, but evolution is his method of creating. And the leading proponent of theistic evolution in the United States today is theistic evolution, which is also now called by the proponents evolutionary creation because they wanna be viewed as creationists. And in a sense, they are creationists because they believe in a creator, but Theistic evolution is, is a more uh, accurate description, I would say. Daryl Falk was um, the former pr uh, president of BioLogos for several years, and uh, he posted this blog on the BioLogos website, uh, which has since been removed, but he said this. Option number one is the standard argument put forward by those who believe in a young earth created by God in six 24-hour days less than 10,000 years ago. Biologos, the organization he was president of, exists in no small part to marginalize this view from the church. A fundamental part of our mission is to show that option one is not tenable. He also said this, uh, one of my theologian friends once said in great frustration over this issue, this creation evolution issue, I wish they had never put the Bible in the hands of ordinary people. It seems to me that we need to take more seriously the teaching ministry of the church. We encourage people to read the Bible on their own, but certain misunderstandings are bound to emerge with that approach. Young people are going to read Genesis and think of Adam and Eve as real biological parents of the human race. Do you see what the issue is? Biologos doesn't want people reading their Bibles by themselves. They want Christians to listen to what experts say. That is robbing the scriptures from the, from the people in the pew. And that is exactly the opposite of what we should do. Biologos in their doctrinal statement say this on their website, Biologos invites the church and the world to see the harmony between science and biblical faith as we present an evolutionary understanding of God's creation. Notice again the vague word science and faith. In their doctrinal statement, they say this, we believe that God created the universe, the earth, and all life over billions of years. We believe that the diversity and interrelation of all life on earth are best explained by the God-ordained process of evolution with common descent. And we believe that God created humans in biological continuity with all life on earth. So they've made their view very, very clear. They are wanting to influence the church to accept all the three strands of evolution and just believe that God used evolution to create. And they are strongly opposed to the view that I am explaining and defending in this series and that Answers in Genesis and many other creation groups have been defending for the last few decades. This view of Biologos has been endorsed by uh, Tim Car uh, Keller, who I quoted earlier, Dr. Bruce Waltke, one of the most famous evangelical Old Testament professors today, and Dr. John Walton, another very famous uh, professing evangelical Old Testament professor. They all affirm Biologos and its mission. Well, that's theistic evolution. But then there are Christians who would be called uh, progressive creationists or intelligent design Christians. And they accept uh, just two strands of the evolutionary view. They reject biological evolution. But most of them, uh, certainly all the progressive creationists and most people in the intelligent design movement uh, accept geological evolution and cosmological evolution. 
They, they accept the millions of years, the billions of years of change. And so I call them uh, two-thirds evolutionist. And uh, probably the most uh, vocal and the most influential proponent of progressive creation is uh, Hugh Ross and his organization, Reasons to Believe. They've produced an enormous number of books, uh, most of them published by Christian publishers. His work has been endorsed by many Christian leaders, theologians, and, and others. Um, and then the intelligent design movement, which is uh, spearheaded by the Discovery Institute based in Seattle, Washington. Stephen Myers, the director of their uh, Center for Science and Culture. And uh, there are many leading scholars who are very supportive of the Discovery Institute and their uh, view of things. Most people in the, dis in the intelligent design movement associated with the Discovery Group and other groups would uh, accept the millions of years or say it doesn't matter, though they are opposing biological evolution, at least atheistic biological evolution. Philip Johnson was kind of the, the uh, father of the modern uh, intelligent design movement. His book, Darwin on Trial, first published in 1991, uh, went, was published in several different languages and lots and lots of people read it. And he uh, argued against biological evolution, but ignored the age of the earth and said it's not important. Um, the, the ID movement is very religiously eclectic. William Dembski has been very involved in the past, not so much today. He's a Southern Baptist. Michael Behe is Roman Catholic. Jonathan Wells was, uh, for many years, I don't know if he still is, a member of um, the Unification Church. Um, Michael Denton is a, a professing agnostic. Stephen Meyer is a Presbyterian. David Berlinski is a secular Jew. Jay Richards is a Roman Catholic. So it's a very religiously diverse group, and they're just opposed to biological evolution or at least atheistic uh, biological evolution. And then we have uh, biblical creationists, and we reject all three strands of evolution. And so uh, organizations that would uh, support this would be Answers in Genesis, the Institute for Creation Research, the Creation Research Society, and, and other groups in the United States and in some other countries. And so they reject all three uh, strands of evolution. And so I say they're zero-thirds evolutionists. Now, theistic evolutionists are really tied up in naturalism. They don't really realize it. They think it's just science. Old Earth creationists are tied up in naturalism, too. Um, they, they think they've gotten rid of biological evolution, and so they think they're free, uh, but they're not really free. They're still, they're still controlled by naturalistic assumptions as they think about geology and astronomy. It's only the, the biblical creationist who's really free from naturalism. As we uh, abide in the Word of God, and then we know the truth, and the truth really sets us free. Well, in my PhD research, I was studying some men in the uh, early 19th century who were opposed to the idea of millions of years that was developing in geology. And uh, one of the pastors who wrote in opposition to those old earth geological ideas uh, said this, a doubt has, I believe, been already raised on the common parentage of the human race. And he's referring to a Christian uh, scholar at uh, one of the uh, universities in England. These Christian scholars do not consider it as invalidating the doctrine of original sin. This affords another illustration of men who pulled down the bulwark but disclaimed any intention of end endangering the citadel. The Trojan horse, drawn within the walls of the devoted city by friendly hands, is a standing emblem of men acting under the unsuspecting guidance of the evil one. He believed that the idea of millions of years was being brought into the church, a Trojan horse, by Christian leaders of his day. And I believe he was right, and I'm going to be showing you more about that early 19th century and how that Trojan horse got into the church in a later presentation. But we, we then think, well, now, wait a minute. Could, could Christian leaders, uh, could they become a mouthpiece for Satan? Could they, 
could they be like uh, the Troy citizens of Troy who, who brought in that Trojan horse uh, full of the army of, of the Greeks? Well, we need to consider carefully what Jesus said to Peter. You know, Jesus uh, was asking the disciples, who do men say that I am? And uh, they said, well, some people say you're a prophet. Some people say this. Some people say that. But Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And um, Jesus said to Peter, you got an A on your theology exam. That's exactly right. That's who I am. And uh, you didn't just figure that out on your own, but God revealed that to you. But then Jesus said, I'm going to be going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die at the hands of sinful men. And Peter, in essence, said, no, you're not, Lord. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. So right after Peter had passed his theology exam with an A, he became a mouthpiece for Satan. How is that possible? Well, Jesus said, Peter, you're setting your mind on God's, uh, on man's interests, on what man thinks, rather than on what God thinks, what God's interests are. Satan used Peter as a mouthpiece. This great apostle who walked on the water to Jesus, who, who was the, the first one to speak the truth about the identity of Jesus, had become a mouthpiece for Satan. Any Christian leader including myself, can become a mouthpiece for Satan if I set my mind on man's interests rather than God's. We have a lot of Christian universities in America and around the world where students are going to learn uh, God's word and uh, they don't realize what they're getting into because they're going into schools where uh, one of the first things they will learn is that you can't trust the first part of the Bible, the first 11 chapters, and their faith is being undermined. And so uh, Wheaton College, Calvin College, those are just two of the most influential and well-known in the United States who are encouraging their students to accept evolution in millions of years. And then in recent years, a growing number of books have been published by evangelical publishers uh, promoting theistic evolution in millions of years. Uh, the two books in the middle, Adam and the Genome and Evolution, Scripture, and Nature say yes. They, they both deny that there ever was a historical, literal Adam and Eve. Uh, and then more conservative books by evangelical publishers uh, the Enduring Authority of the Christian Scriptures, Controversy of the Ages, and Theistic Evolution. These are books that would reject uh, theistic evolution, but say, directly or indirectly, the age of the earth doesn't matter. Listen to this uh, interview uh, in a Canadian television program with Dr. William Lane Craig, one of the most influential uh, Christian philosophers today. How old is the world? Best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now, this is good, you see. I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's six and a half thousand years old. Um, you, that, that is not a tenable position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, mm. the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science okay. in presenting these arguments. Rather, I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology and astrophysics uh, supports. Is there a contradiction or an inc inconsistency between the biblical account of the age of, of the earth and, and your statement? Well, that's uh, interesting because there isn't any biblical account of the age of the earth. There's right. nothing in the Genesis or elsewhere in the Bible that says how old the universe is. So, no, I don't think it is incompatible. Hmm. Uh, we often hear that there are, there are the caricatured argument that uh, Christians believe that man and dinosaur coexisted. There are some creationists, they typically style themselves young earth creationists, mm -hmm. who believe that. I've even seen children's books where Noah takes uh, dinosaur eggs on the ark with him. Well, all of this is reading between the lines. There's nothing like that in the book of Genesis. Mm. Dr. Craig is a brilliant man. He has two uh, PhDs, uh, but he hasn't read creationist dinosaur books very carefully because uh, we don't believe that Noah took dinosaur eggs on the ark. 
we believe he took live dinosaurs on the ark. But you know, he said, um, the Bible doesn't say anything about the age of the earth. Genesis doesn't say anything about that. Well, we're going to consider that. Um, Dr. Craig couldn't be farther from the truth on that point. But he also said, the arguments I give are right in line with mainstream science. I'm not bucking up against mainstream science. Rather, I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology and astrophysics supports. In other words, he's totally accepted the Big Bang cosmology, the naturalistic story about the universe, and that is what is controlling and guiding his thinking about the Bible and about Genesis in particular. That's a problem. To go along with mainstream science is going along with the naturalistic worldview that is controlling science. And as a philosopher, he should see that clearly, but he doesn't. Now, Dr. Craig certainly believes in the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, but it is inconsistent to believe in the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus because the Bible teaches these things, but yet to deny the literal history in Genesis 1 to 11 because mainstream science rejects it. Why is that inconsistent? Because the same scientific community that rejects Genesis 1 to 11 as real history, literal, accurate history, that same scientific establishment says virgins don't have babies and dead men don't rise from the dead. So Dr. Craig is just being a selective in which of the truths in the Bible he believes and which uh, he will allow uh, the scientific mainstream to reinterpret. More recently, he's published a book on the origin of man. And uh, Sean McDowell, a prominent apologist here in the United States, interviewed him. This is what he had to say. Obviously, all of us have a viewpoint hmm. from which we begin. But that doesn't mean that we cannot try to be objective in how we weigh the evidence okay. and arguments. And I have struggled mm -hmm. as best I can to weigh the evidence objectively to determine our biblical commitments. Now, I would be disingenuous, Sean, hmm. if I were to say, I don't want the young earth creationist interpretation to come out true. Okay. Uh, to me, that is a nightmare. Uh, my, my greatest mm -hmm. fear is that the young earth creationist might be right in his mm -hmm. hermeneutical claim mm -hmm. that Genesis does teach those things that I described earlier. And I say that would be a nightmare because if that's what the Bible teaches, it puts the Bible into massive, I think, irredeemable conflict with modern science, history, wow. and linguistics. And I don't want that to happen. So. Yes, yes, it's true. I, okay. I don't want young earth creationist uh, <laughs> interpretation to okay. be right. But nevertheless, I really do in the book struggle to be as objective as I can in saying mm. what did these narratives mean to their original audience when they were written and read? Well, Dr. Craig is really not thinking carefully here because it is po impossible to be absolutely objective, to be outside uh, and just looking at the evidence. Everybody has a worldview. And Dr. Craig has embraced a naturalistic worldview in terms of uh, the question of origins. He doesn't accept that naturalistic worldview in his view of Jesus and, and uh, salvation and uh, God and for most, for the most part, the Bible. But he is looking at Genesis in light of mainstream science. That is not an unbiased view. And uh, he is strongly opposed to the young earth view. But we're going to see as we go through these uh, lectures, does the Bible, is it really that difficult to understand? Does it really uh, allow us to accept what mainstream science is saying about origins? Uh, I hope that you will stay with us here in this series and see it does not. It is impossible. And uh, we'll come back to some of Dr. Craig's ideas about Adam in a later lecture. 
uh, he's not paying careful attention to the details of the biblical text, which he does affirm is the inerrant word of God. Well, Dr. Craig is just one of many of our leading, most famous apologists in America who are all directly or indirectly promoting the acceptance of millions of years. They say the age of the earth doesn't matter, or they might even go farther and, and endorse uh, publicly an old earth view like the gap theory or the day age view. Um, and three of the uh, universities or seminaries in America that are producing the most apologists, defenders of the faith, are promoting an old earth view. There might be a couple of young earth professors at maybe one or two of those schools, but the school is, is churning out apologists just like the others who are convinced the age of the earth is a side issue, it doesn't matter, and they're not committed to the biblical worldview in its full sense. A few years ago, um, I had one of our staff at Answers in Genesis who was thinking of going on to seminary. Um, I had him, I gave him a, um, an idea to write 50 evangelical seminaries that I picked out for him. They were pretty well known. And to write to them as a pers prof pr prospective student uh, and ask them, you know, what, what does the uh, seminary teach about Genesis? Is there a required course on Genesis? If there is, does that course uh, deal with the creation evolution issue? Uh, is there a required course on apologetics for uh, men who are getting the masters of divinity preparing to become pastors? And, and if they have an apologetics course, uh, does it deal with the creation evolution issue? And I, I, uh, urged him to write from his personal email account so they wouldn't know the question was coming from somebody from Answers in Genesis. And so the results of the survey, 36 schools responded to him. One fourth of them um, said that they were young earth creationists, but they were mostly small seminaries. Uh, only two of those 36 schools that responded have a, a Masters of Divinity program that had a required course on Genesis that dealt with the origins issue. Three other MDiv programs at other seminaries had an elective on Genesis, but one of those didn't deal with the origins issue in their course on Genesis. And then only three of the MDiv programs from those 36 schools had a required course on apologetics, and one of those didn't deal with the question of origins. So we have a real problem in the church. And if I were to uh, do a survey like this, if I could, in uh, seminaries outside the United States and other countries, uh, I don't, I'm not aware in all of my travels in, in 35 countries, I'm not aware of, of any young earth seminaries outside the United States. And uh, most of those seminaries probably don't have an apologetics program and wouldn't deal with this question of origins at all. So we have a real problem in the church because most churches, not only in America, but around the world, um, they're, they're teaching the Bible, but they're ignoring the Genesis controversy. Uh, they're just teaching Bible stories. They might teach uh, something from the early chapters of Genesis, but a lot of pastors never preach from Genesis 1 to 11, or if they do, they just, talk about the, the moral and the spiritual issues, uh, things we can learn about God, things we can learn about marriage and family. But in the world, they have a curriculum in the, in the secular education schools. Uh, and in those curriculums, they're teaching the students to think that what they're learning is the real history of the world. In most churches, in most seminaries, they're not teaching any apologetics, but in the world, they're teaching apologetics in the schools. Uh, they're teaching the evidence, so-called, for millions of years in evolution against the Bible. And so there's a real battle going on, and most churches, most seminaries, most Christian colleges are not equipping their students and the people in their church how to understand the battle and defend the faith and the truth and the biblical worldview. And so we need a real reformation again in the church. We need to nail, uh, figuratively speaking, Genesis 1 to 11 on the doors of churches. 
And that's what Answers in Genesis is seeking to do and other creation ministries in this country and other countries to call the church back to the word of God, to stop ignoring uh, the details of Genesis 1 to 11 and to understand it as the literal history that the Bible clearly indicates that it is. And we'll be talking about the evidence that it is real accurate history and not some symbolic uh, poetry or, or mythology. So this is a critical issue. We need to think carefully. We need to have a biblical worldview, a fully biblical worldview, not a partial worldview. We need to be ready to make a defense. And uh, we need really strong apologetics in the church. So I hope that you'll stay with us as we go through these topics and begin to dig more deeply into what the Bible actually says and um, what real science says that confirms the literal history in Genesis. Mm -hmm.